good evening and welcome. And let me start by acknowledging that we are indeed privileged to be gathered this evening on the traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. And thank you for being here. We live in remarkable times. Never in his history have so many people on earth been so well off. We enjoy the longest life expectancy, the greatest technological capacity, the highest level of intellectual accomplishment. We understand the physics, the chemistry, and the biology of our environment better than ever before. Yet despite our wealth, and despite our knowledge, the world faces another calamitous famine across North Africa, from Sudan to Nigeria. Between the effects of climate change and of wars tearing at the Middle East, we see waves of refugees flowing north into Europe, raising tensions within a multi-nation community that has been a model for international cooperation. And we also face unprecedented inequality, not only amongst nations, but within the wealthiest nations on earth. It is in this context and at this important time that the 2017 SFU Public Square Community Summit is exploring Canada's place in the world. What role is there for a medium power with a diverse population and an open economy that has prided itself on policies of humanitarianism, internationalism, and freer trade? How can Canada best position itself to influence world events while at the same time protecting its interests and preserving its values? Whatever the answers, and I grant you they are not easy or clear, we at SFU are delighted to be convening this discussion. SFU Public Square and the Community Summit are products of Simon Fraser University's strategic vision, a vision which challenges us to be Canada's most community-engaged research university. When we developed that vision in 2012, we did so because we believed universities have an important role to play in creating forums for dialogue, in op providing opportunities to commu for communities to come together, to share information, to exchange views, and to seek common ground. And as part of this commitment, we invite the community to participate in an annual summit on a question of public importance. So tonight, with the help of one of Canada's premier pollsters and public opinion analyst, Nick Nanos, we drilled down into a regional question of growing interest and importance. What does a Trump presidency mean for Canada? Economically, militarily, and intuitively, we know that Canada's fate is closely tied to that of the United States. So it's timely to ask, what impacts will the new American administration have on us? And what are our options in the face of those impacts? Before we, get under, under, before we get underway, I'd like to introduce Catherine Murray, SFU's Associate Dean of Arts and Social Science. It's thanks to Dr. Murray, the Center for Public Opinion and Political Representation, and the Department of Political Science that we brought this evening's program together. And I'd like to invite Dr. Murray to come forward and share a few words. Catherine Murray. On behalf of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at Simon Fraser University, welcome to this reflection on the anger of nations. Canada has not been immune to public anger in the past, and it is unlikely to be insulated in the future. So what is the challenge that the so-called anger of nations presents to those who teach, work, and research in a public university? I think there is no better way to underline the value of an education in the arts, humanities, and social sciences in interpreting today's turbulent times than to tackle these questions. Indeed, many of our panelists tonight, and I have to get this plug in, Andrew, uh, do in fact have degrees in history, political science, journalism backgrounds. In uh, the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, we are dedicated to create a space where many disciplines can converge on the important public issues of the day. We must explore the so-called roots of anger or grievance claims, how individual anger spreads through social circles, inflames national minorities, even majorities, overtakes language and political discourse, and permeates our zeitgeist. But we also raise questions about the validity of empirical facts behind such study, and I know Nick Nanus will share some of these with you today. And we must question the logic of its trajectory and raise ethical questions, not only about the limits to public anger, but also about its absence 
especially if there are grounds for claims of gross injustice. Anger is not always bad, but for many scholars, its positive and negative aspects are less important to understand than how it arises, when, and under what circumstances it can lead to the decline of nations, international instability, or when such fears are baseless. At a time when democracy is in retreat around the world, public anger apparently rising, and seeking an outlet, the capacity to understand the sources, the combustion points, the capacity to reconcile, accommodate, and adjust to public anger, creatively challenge it, channel it rather, and make the institutional reforms needed to respond authentically to it, has never been higher. We need more and better research and theoretical engagement from the arts and social sciences today in times of great public need. And we are in those times today and starting the journey of understanding tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine, and for that excellent plug for the humanities and social sciences. Now to guide us through the program, it's my great pleasure to introduce our moderator for the evening, Laura Lynch. Loyal CBC listeners, including some who got up very early this morning, will know Laura because she has uh, been a major presence on CBC for more than 20 years. Uh, she's been a correspondent in London and in Washington and has covered everything from the attacks of September 11th and the subsequent uh, conflict in Afghanistan to the more recent upheavals in Syria and Iran. More recently, she's been a regular guest host on The Current, As It Happens, the Sunday edition, and this morning on the early edition. Among her other achievements, Laura has held a Neiman Fellowship at Harvard University and won awards from the British Bar Association, Amnesty International, the Overseas Press Club in New York, and the Gabrielle Awards. Please join me in offering a very warm welcome to our host for this evening, CBC's Laura Lynch. Thanks, Catherine, for actually framing the evening really well, so well that, I, that I'm not going to try to do all of that again. What I think I want to do is just give you an idea of how things are going to unfold this evening. The first thing I'm going to ask you to do, if you haven't done it already, is turn off the ringers on your phone so that we don't uh, disturb any of the presentations. Um, first of all, we are going to hear a keynote from our main speaker, Nick Nanos, and that's going to be followed by our panel of respondents who are going to be up on the stage each getting about five minutes to outline their thoughts. We're going to try to keep them to five minutes each. After that, I'm going to moderate a discussion uh, with all of our guests. And then after that, we're going to open up the floor to you to ask some questions. So uh, be thinking about that as you're listening to everything you hear this evening. And so to our main speaker, Nick Nanos has been in the business of analyzing and understanding public opinion for a very long time. He started while he was still in university 30 years ago and hasn't stopped. He provides research and advice on a wide range of issues in both politics and business. He is the pollster of record for the Globe and Mail, Bloomberg News, and CTV News. Not us, but you know. <laughs> and perhaps one measure of Nick's reputation, he is on the 2017 list of the top 100 most powerful and influential in government and politics in Canada, according to the Hill Times. Please welcome Nick Manos. Uh, thank you for what I think was a kind introduction. I was in a dark room in the back. <laughs> they do that a lot to pollsters. Um, so thank you for inviting me to join you today to talk about uh, Canada's role in the world who needs Canada, the anger of nations. And uh, one thing that I want to put on the table is what I'm going to do is we're going to take what I would consider a very complex topic and run a straight line through it, right? Because the purpose tonight is to engage, to put ideas on the table, and to start a dialogue about the role of Canada in the world, what we can do, and also what is happening in the world and how that is impacting us specifically what's going on in the United States. So I'm going to do a number of things. First of all, I'm going to unpack 
what I'm calling the anger of nations. And we're going to look at what's going on in the United States and in other countries and how that might be relevant to Canada. Then I'm going to put some, and big surprise, I have some polling numbers, so I'm going to put some polling numbers on the table in terms of how Canadians feel about the Trump administration and our, about our relationship with the United States and how that might be changing. And then I'm going to close with uh, our role and what it could be. So to start off, I want to start off with four simple words. What were they thinking? <laughs> right? And I think the reality is, is that if you were in the United States, and I would put the Brexit vote in the same category, if you're in the UK or the United States, or you were outside of the UK or the United States, and you were watching what was going on, that was probably what was going through your mind for a significant proportion of citizens in both of those countries. It's kind of like the car crash. The car crash that you are both attracted and repelled to at the same time, that you see happening in slow motion, and that it's, if you're watching it and you're in disbelief, thinking it's not going to happen, it's not going to happen, it's not going to happen, there's no way this is going to happen. And then the car crash happens. And I want you to think of those four words as we kind of unpack the anger of nations and our perceptions related to the United States and Canada's role around the world. And one thing I'd like to do to start, I'd like you to imagine something. Imagine something quite simple. Imagine you come home from work or school and there is a foreclosure notice on your home when you show up. Imagine you lose your job and then your next job, you are underemployed, maybe not employed full-time, you're working part-time. Maybe you're making less than what you were making before. And imagine you walking in your neighborhood or in your community, downtown, uptown, in the suburbs, and you have a sense that things are on the decline. It's not as good as the good old days, right? that our public spaces aren't as well kept, that we're not making public investments in infrastructure, that we feel that, whether true or not, there's more crime. That's the primary frame, I think, that many citizens, not just in Canada, not just in the United States, but many citizens around the world are dealing with. They're dealing with fundamental change and transformation. And in this world, transformation ain't necessarily good. So what I want you to do is think about people feeling like that and then being asked to vote. And then to have politicians, and we won't name names or parties or whether it's a left wing or a right wing ideology, who tells them that it's somebody else's fault. You haven't done anything wrong. It's somebody else's fault. It is this group of people. It is this institution in your capital. It is these types of business people that are the cause of all your problems. And then imagine that you're asked to vote in an election, in a referendum. And this is what I would consider the fundamental frame. And what I'd like to put on the table is the idea that, and of course I found out, I found out the format, like the final format, and I didn't really you know, what I found out was that after I talk, there are kind of three official rebuttals to what I have to say. So, uh, so, so I can, you know, there's, if you see people with notepads in the front, those are the people that will be uh, tearing me apart uh, after I finish. But uh, think of that. So think of the anger of nations and what's going on as the primary frame for people when they're voting and the primary driver. And what I want to say is, when we see people who say things that are racist, xenophobic, inappropriate, I'd like to say that those are symptoms. That the fundamental cause is that people feel insecure. And the symptom is to be more racist or to be xenophobic. Right? And that 
One of the things that we have to think about, not just as a nation, but in terms of this whole situation in general, is how do we deal with the root cause? Right? Because if someone feels that they're underemployed, and a politician exercises what I'll say populist demagogue politics, then they're still going to be vulnerable to those types of views. So what are the things, at least that I'd like to put on the table, that make up the anger of nations? First of all, one thing that I've noticed in a lot of these new populist movements, because they're a little different than populist movements in the past, is that now the primary focus is the establishment. That these populist mo movements look to identify an enemy or a problem, the establishment, for Donald Trump, right? It would be the Washington establishment. He talk about lobbyists, politicians, Democrats, the Clintons, right? Needing to drain the swamp. Right? He talked about Wall Street bankers. That would be the establishment that he would fight against. And you know, the thing is, is that I think maybe the one thing uh, that Donald Trump has done, you know, he's not only against, for example, the Washington establishment and the, the Wall Street establishment and the media establishment, he's also against the Republican establishment. That's his enemy too. Right? But you have to remember that it's all about being against something and being against the establishment. Same thing for Nigel Farage. For anyone that followed UK politics, if you look, open the newspaper or watch TV and saw a picture of Nigel Farage, what would it be a picture of? Two things. Any guesses? Beer. beer a pint of beer in one hand and a cigarette in the other. A guy who did not go to university, who was an outsider, derided by David Cameron as a wingnut and kook and fruitcake, right? A man who ran against the establishment. For him, the, the establishment that he was running against was in Europe, even though he was a member of the European Parliament. Right? But that was the establishment, the target. Same thing, and you know, Schultz is, for those of you that don't know, he is the new leader of the Social Democratic Party in Germany. The interesting thing about him is that he has a, he is attacking the SPD numbers have been going up in the last two months, where now he's competitive with Angela Merkel. His tact has been to attack Donald Trump and the Americans, and then to attack Angela Merkel as being too friendly with Donald Trump. That's how he's framed the establishment. But you know, the key takeaway is that all of these leaders focus on, and these movements, have a frame of being against the establishment. And then the other thing is, is the angry tale. And the angry tale, and I'll say this is my favorite part because it has uh, it's, a, it's a bit numerical. You know, many times I've asked, um, I have, uh, we don't do any work for any political party because we're nonpartisan and have that as a policy. But I get, obviously, I bump into politicians and they always ask the same question. What can we do to win? What should we do to win? And um, usually one of the things that I say is quite simply, okay, can you persuade one in 20 people to change their vote. And I said, yeah, it sounds really easy. I said, well, if you can do that, then you can win an election. It's as simple as that. If we look at the last election in Canada, if one in 20 or 5% of Canadians switched from the Liberals to the New Democrats, because in the last Canadian election, it was about Liberal NDP switchers. Well, we might have had either a Trudeau minority government or even a Stephen Harper minority government. So just put that into context. And how about another context? So you think 1 in 20 is scary. How about 1 in 50? In the UK vote, there were 33 million voters. The Leave side won by 1 million voters. That is one voter in 50 switching. Are you scared? Let's talk about the US election. 137 million voters, right? We know what the popular vote, what happened in the popular vote, but when we look at the distribution of the Electoral College vote, what's quite interesting is that 104,000 votes in Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, that was the margin of Donald Trump. He picked up another 49 Electoral College votes. 104,000. Rivet that number into your head. If one in 1,250 voters in the exact right place had voted for Hillary Clinton instead of Donald Trump, 
we'd, it'd be like Star Trek. We'd be in the alternative universe right now, right? <laughs> but what I want to point is that small swings in numbers have always had an impact on electoral outcomes. But what's different is what's driving these. Oh, see, I pressed the switch I wasn't supposed to press, right? What's different is the anger that's driving them. And the other thing that's interesting is that in this movement, it is not as many say, in my opinion, it is not a right-wing movement. It is a movement that can move to either the right or the left because it basically comes to who can punish the establishment. And the other thing about this is this is not a traditional class war. We usually say rich people vote in a particular way, lower-income people vote in another way. What's interesting is that when you look at the actual data of what happened in the Brexit vote and the Trump vote, the key dividing line, or the most significant dividing line in my opinion, was actually based on educational attainment. The lower the educational attainment, the more likely you were to be part of the anti-establishment. That was very true in the Brexit vote. It's also true when you look at the exit polling in the United States. And that education is actually, could be the new, almost class-like dividing line in society in the future. And that there are economic factors. You know, in leading up to the Brexit vote, in the six years leading up to the Brexit vote, the real wages of, of people in England went down 10%. Made 10% less. So you imagine how you would feel when David Cameron and the Conservatives, Conservative government and the Remain side would say how wonderful Europe is and how great the UK economy is doing. And then that's all you know is that compared to six years ago, you're making 10% less. Or in the United States, 9 million Americans lost their home. So let's do some quick math. 9 million Americans lose their home, and I would consider that a traumatic experience. Two and a half people in every household in the United States, that's 22 odd million Americans. Think of them and their families scarred because they're upset that they lost their home, or that their brother lost their home, or their son or daughter lost their home. And the other thing is, is, and I think this is particularly important for Canada, is what I'm calling the contagion effect, right? Copycat politicians. I'll tell you, this is what we should worry about the most. When Donald Trump says something, he actually gives license to behavior and other things to be said, right? The same thing for, for Farage, it's the same thing for Le Pen, it's the same thing for any of those politicians that practice that kind of politics. It gives license to things that undermine the fabric of society. And fake news. We hear a lot about fake news. Okay. Uh, I have two questions on this fake news board. First of all, uh, what is the percentage of things that Donald Trump said that was known to be absolutely true? Come on, tell me. Zero. Sorry, I'm running out of time. Four. Four percent. Four percent of what Donald Trump, according to PolitiFact, said during the election was absolutely true. Now, a little more was partly true, but 4% was considered absolutely true. Now, same question, Hillary Clinton, how much did she say that was absolutely true? Same measure, same category. 89. You're so more, yes, 24% actually. Yeah, so, you know, is there really two candidates that are telling the truth? And here's a, here's a question. Any philosophy majors in the category here? No? Yes. Existential question for philosophy major. If a politician lies and the media report it, is it fake news? No, seriously. If a politician lies, think of the UK election vote, right? Nigel Farage said that, uh, and, the, and the Brexiteers said that they'd be able to repatriate 340 million pounds a week and they could put it into the National Health Service. During that same week, the National Statistical Agency said that's actually wrong. But that was, but the thing is, is the Farage claim was repeated in the news. And you know, polling showed that people were more likely to believe the Farage claim of the 340 million, pa million pound patriation than the Remain claim, which was that each household would lose or be hit with a 4,300 pound kind of loss. So in this particular case, the truth was not believed because 70% of Britons 
disbelieve the truth, but they are more likely to believe the lie. Are you cheered up? Social media. <laughs> right? Uh, Donald Trump, 28 million Twitter followers. Hillary Clinton, 11 million Twitter followers. But here's the kicker. And I could tell by looking at the audience that some of you will understand what I'm about to say. I remember before the internet, and as, uh, because I have a degree, one of my degrees is in political science, I remember thinking the internet, this is going to be so wonderful because now we will be able to fact, no one will be able, politicians will not be able to lie because the truth will be on the internet. Whenever they say something, we're going to say, oh, that's a lie, right? Well, I don't think that's the case, right? That, you know, there is now a fake information ecosystem out there that is actually feeding our democracy and hypothetically informing voters. And I'm going to be very brief on this truth versus symbolism, but this is, you know, this is linked to the fake news. In that, you know, the politicians that are exercising this type of politics are not interested necessarily in the truth. That might be harsh to say, but they're interested in the symbolism, right? So, for example, as noted in the Atlantic magazine, when they were analyzing Donald Trump, they said, well, Donald Trump, so the people that didn't support Donald Trump took him literally, and then when he said stuff like, oh, I'm going to tear up NAFTA or build a wall, people who took him literally said, well, that's just stupid. Right? But his supporters took him symbolically. They took, they took him very seriously. <laughs> That when he said he was going to build a wall, they took that as the symbol of what he wanted to do. When he said he was going to fight globalism and bad trade deals, they believed in the symbolism of that. And this is where you get into kind of a fuzzier type area. So what does this all mean in terms of our relationship with the United States? Well, what's critical, and we cannot forget this, is that there may be some citizens in Canada that do not like what is happening in the United States, but this chart sums up the reality. This is the world according to the economy. And you can see America, 24.32% of global GDP. Canada, 2.09%. So whenever we talk about our role and relationship with the United States, we have to think about this harsh fact, right? Donald Trump is the president of the largest economy in the world. Period. Full stop. Now, how do Canadians feel about this? And, you know, there are a number of ways to characterize this. And what I find quite interesting in the, uh, in the data is that there are two threads that you should remember. The first thread is we're ready to fight or disagree with our neighbor. And the second thread is we know that we could lose just because of who we are. So when we ask Canadians whether they're willing to slap tariffs or go have a trade war with the United States, you can see here that three out of every four Canadians support or somewhat support retaliatory measures against our most important trading partner that we have a historic friendship with. And to put this into context, are we going to win this? No. <laughs> this is a matter of principle. And, you know, what I want to say and what I want you to remember is that in a lot of the polling, and we're releasing, I was looking at my watch, you know, in a lot of the polling that we're doing, we're releasing a new poll tonight about what people think about asylum seekers and stuff like that. And people don't think that they're a terrorist threat, right? They're happy to have immigration. They like the policy that we have. They're glad that Canada is welcoming. But the key takeaway that, and we ask them whether we want, whether how Canadians feel about aligning our environmental strategy with the United States. No, thank you. Aligning our immigration. Right? That it's kind of, this is kind of like going to be more like a business relationship. It will be cordial because they are our most important business and, and economic partner. But it's going to be guarded. And, you know, what's interesting is that now Canadians see a role for ourselves in the world. And this is where we get to the discussion here at Simon Fraser. And you can see here that three out of every four Canadians agree or somewhat agree that we should be taking a leading role as in terms of progressive values and that we should be willing to kind of mix it up. This was a survey in December, right after the election, 
but that we, can, we should be sticking to our identity and our values, and that we are comfortable with that. So, what is our path forward? A number of factors. Cordial but not warm is what I would say is what Canadians would probably recommend. It's kind of like, you know, it was like the uh, handshake. You know, <laughs> don't, it's got to be the firm handshake. It's got to be like this. Don't let them uh, do the what do they call it? The uh, the Muppet. Don't let them make you a Muppet where you grab your hand and pull you down. So it's one of those things, right? Second, trade plan B, which is Europe. Now we've seen in the polling data, and what's shifted since Donald Trump, is that Canadians are now more fixated on trade, more so with Europe than with countries like China, because they see Europe as a comparable economy to ours with similar values. Progressive politics, that Canadians, and I think the reality is, is that we have a progressive government right now, and that Canadians are comfortable with our progressive government acting progressively, overtly, right? Uh, globally and on the continent. And I wanted to put this on the table in terms of renewing the Federation because the reality is, is the other thing that we have to do is that we have to have our own house in order in terms of free trade and the economy, right? As we go into a period of uncertainty with the United States. And what I want to, uh, what is also quite important is that in the same way that people might not like whoever the Prime Minister of the day is, or they might not like whoever the President of the day is, the reality is, is they happen to be the President. They will not be the President forever. The Prime Minister will not be the Prime Minister forever. And that we should not confuse or project our views of a particular administration on the American people. And that's why it's going to be very important that the Prime Minister and the government of Canadians continue to kind of reach out. And to remember the fragility of the victory. And you know what? We should, be, we should remember that, but also be afraid. Because it means that in Canada, we could be susceptible to these same forces. Why? Now, it's interesting. This is the number that we have that pops. Should we be worried that only 14% of Canadians think that the next generation will have a higher standard of living than our generation? Is that positive or positive enough? I don't think so. So we shouldn't be smug, is what I'm saying. We should not be smug at all. We should not be smug because of the lack of hope, and this is declinism. This is not anger. So I would say we're not angry in Canada, kind of a normal thing. It's just, we are more susceptible to declinism, and we're seeing that in a number of European countries. So who needs Canada? First of all, this is good news, my last slide, wherever, wherever my timekeeper is. Um, yes, one minute. Good, thank you. <laughs> Who needs Canada? Uh, you know, it's interesting. I, uh, because of what I do, I get to hang around some interesting people, including some retired diplomats. And I remember they'd always say, I'd always ask about, can you talk to me about the idea, you know, that someone, one of my, one of my friends used to be the ambassador to the United Nations and other amb ambassadors to other countries. And I, I say, can you talk to me about being a middle power? What does that mean? And he goes, well, you know, you can read all the stuff in the, uh, in the school books, but the reality is, is that being a middle power, Canada's, Canada had, his best leverage that Canada had was to shame superpowers. Because we didn't have the economic or military power or the votes to influence superpowers. But we could shame them by behaving in a particular way. And you know, one of the examples that was used was apartheid, right? That Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, even though they had very good relations with Brian Mulroney, the progressive conservative prime minister, were very upset of his stance against the apartheid regime. The reality is he shamed them, right? And he doggedly shamed them because he stood on a matter of principle. The other thing is, is right now, globalism is under threat. And, you know, the other thing is, is we have to think of whatever happens in Canada as also having a positive, a potential positive impact on the United States. And, you know, at the very beginning of my talk, I said four words. What were they thinking? Let's take those four words and apply them to Canada. What were they thinking? Because I think when other countries look at Canada, something else comes to mind. Something that they believe 
is right and different, counter to what's happening in other places. So I'd like you to chew on that, and, uh, and I'd like to say thank you for your attention. I hope I was moderately uh, entertaining. Uh, and uh, I look forward to being beaten up by the next three speakers. <laughs>